Welcome to lesson 14.1. These are the objectives that we're going to cover this lesson. First of all, we're going to have to learn the formula for formal charge. Uh, to do this, you could use a, a stable molecule like water. And what you're trying to do is the molecule is very stable if everything, if the formula gives a charge of zero for everything. If that's not possible, uh, go to the most electronegative atom and make sure that has the most uh, negative charges on it and that will be your favored molecule. So how do we get zeros on this? Well the uh, valence electrons uh, are six, the bonding electrons are uh, four, and the non-bonding electrons are four. Uh, so the valence electrons uh, you will have to, that's going to be the largest, uh, so you'll have to minus these numbers to get zero. Uh, divide one of these by two. Now because that's shared uh, it doesn't, you could consider that as not really originally belonging to the oxygen so it would make more sense to grab the bonding electrons and divide that one by two instead. Uh, so you can kind of guess this formula valence electrons minus half bonding electrons minus non-bonding electrons by looking at an example molecule and seeing what sort of formula would give you a, a zero answer. Uh, once you've worked out the formula uh, you can go forth and solve other problems. So here is a problem. Use formal charge to determine this, which was the correct structure. Uh, so we start with writing out uh, the formula as always with all our problems. Uh, valence electrons it was half minus bonding electrons minus non-bonding electrons. Uh, the nitrogen uh, from the periodic table is five. Uh, there are six bonds, uh, sorry, three bonds, so that's six electrons, half that, two non-bonding electrons, so the formal charge is zero. Uh, if you look at the carbon, uh, the periodic table says that's four electrons always. Happen to be, that's all joined up, so there's eight, so there's four. Uh, Divide that by two is four, no non-bonding. Same with sulfur, six, just one bond. And there are six non-bonding electrons, that so gives you minus one. Doing the other structure in a similar way, um, you'll get these values here. So you have uh, an equal situation here where you have minus one and minus one. Uh, so both structures seem to be um, reasonable. So now we have to look at the electronegativities and because nit nitrogen has a higher electronegativity. The correct structure must be the one on the right hand side, not the left. Similar problem, these two structures are reasonable enough as well. Uh, formal charge again, so write out the formula. Uh, the valence electrons always from the periodic table. Each line represents two electrons, so there's the boron adds up to uh, eight there. And there's no non bonding electrons on this one. Uh, remember, this is also an exception as well, it doesn't have to have a full octet. Um, and so you'll get the numbers here, minus one, zero, plus one. The other molecule has all zeros on it. Uh, so that one's uh, easier. It must be the right hand side one again. Moving on to shapes now, we have the extended, uh, expanded shells. Now we had exceptions with um, shells that didn't make the octet with beryllium and boron in standard level. Now for high level you have to look at larger molecules that will have five or six domains. Uh, so let's first have a look at the shapes. So these ones are all five electron domains. This happens because the molecules are getting larger now so they can fit more. Uh, you remove that out and now you have a seesaw shape. Make note of the angles. Uh, please note the electrons, free electron pairs of course the most repulsion and the least repulsion will happen around the, the centre, the blue ones. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. So there's a T-shaped and finally you get the linear shaped. Alright, moving on to even larger sizes, you can fit six electron domains around it, so that gives you an octahedral shape. Again, you must memorize all the angles as well. And remove one of those, you get a square pyramidal. And 
remove one of those again you'll get a square planar. So the first thing to take note of here is with the five electron domains the free electron pairs always form around the equatorial axis. Uh, this is because if you put the first free electron pair here uh, the repulsion would be by these three here so you'd get repelled by three uh, different other bonds here whereas if you put uh, the electron pair here instead uh, there is only two bonds in close proximity uh, so it's much more comfortable for free electron pairs to go around the equatorial first before they go to the axial so this explains the first one uh, why you have a seesaw here um, if it wasn't the case of what we just discussed before, uh, you would have a, a trigonal pyramidal. Uh, so that doesn't occur because uh, there is too much repulsion going on. It's, it's easier to be in this situation here. Uh, the angles need to be remembered, so uh, it's easier just to remember for every uh, extra electron pair. Uh, you could minus two or three degrees off. Here is a summary uh, of all the different uh, example molecules here. Now, uh, how are we going to remember these things? Well, first, these ones are the easiest because they tell you how many bonding pairs there are. There's five. Uh, for these ones here, sulfur chlorine, uh, if you have a look at your periodic table, you can see that uh, we're generally going to learn that for these ones here, they're going to be five uh, domains and we're going to look at some examples further down. Uh, once they get bigger down here we're going to call them six domains. Now the exception here is uh, xenon fluoride. We're go you know, I'm going to show you in a second now uh, when we go to six domains that even if this was an extra domain here and it was uh, six you're still going to get the linear shape. Uh, so note that that is an exception to this way of, of remembering or trying to work out whether they're five or six domains. Moving here on to the six domain ones, uh, again it tells you here, so that takes the uh, the trickiness out of it, uh, and these ones here are lower than period three, uh, so they're much larger, so that's how you're going to work out that they're six. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, if this was uh, XEF2 and it happened to be six, well what would happen is that would become an electron, uh, free electron pair, and so with that one there. And so the end result here, would that would still be linear even if it was 5 or 6. Uh, but you need to be careful of that because it doesn't fit this sort of memorization sort of pattern that we're learning. Moving on to uh, overlapping orbitals. Uh, we mentioned this in, in standard level. Uh, what we have here is the pi bonds that we've already talked about. So pi bonds are only can only form from p orbitals and they are from the overlapping sort of the resonance that we talked about. Uh, we're going to learn one extra which is the sigma uh, and that is along the axis. So if we move on to the next slide we can see here uh, the P ones are over here and if they if that existed um, that would be the the pi bonds uh, and we're going to learn now that the ones that the bonds that form along the axis, the first bond, the single bond can form from either two overlapping s orbitals, an s and a p, or two overlapping p's. So that's called a sigma bond. Uh, here is just a nice picture of the pi bond with the two overlapping p orbitals. Putting this all together now, uh, so a single bond must always be the sigma. So you can see here that's the sigma. And we'll just take one of these random ones in the sigma. Uh, and the leftover one is a pi. Uh, and so for this one here, there's two pi bonds. Lastly for this lesson and most painfully is the ozone because uh, it's a case study and you're going to have to memorize a few things for this. The first thing is the bond order. Uh, so when there's resonance going on for ozone uh, you need to divide the number of bonding pairs by the number of positions. Uh, so that's actually a bond order of 1.5. There's 1.5 bonds here and 1.5 bonds here. Just the, an example for carbonate that we've done before as well. Uh, the resonance going on here, so there's a, a 1.3 bond order going on here. Uh, from memory, we drew it uh, as such with the resonance. That's a one and a third bond order. 
and uh, a minus two on three charge. Uh, the importance of ozone here, uh, it actually prevents us getting cancer by absorbing uh, UV radiation here, up here in the stratosphere. Uh, but actually down uh, where we live, down in the troposphere, it's actually dangerous. It will destroy um, materials. Now the uh, equations for ozone, this was uh, done in a previous unit. This must be uh, remembered. So just to re review that again, uh, you'll need to remember 242. Uh, this was a weaker bond as it was a, a stronger bond, sorry, as it was a double bond. So it needs the smaller, higher energy uh, wavelength radiation to break it. This is a longer wavelength, uh, so it's lower energy. Uh, and so that can break the, uh, the one and a half, the weaker bonds of the ozone, the O3. Uh, just remember also the radicals, that's not a, an electron. That just indicates that that is... Uh, a radical which means it has a missing valence shell, it's not a complete uh, valence shell, so it's, it's very reactive. Also please note uh, the bond angle is 117, uh, please learn that as well because we're focusing on ozone as a case study. These equations here are in your data booklet, uh, so just be aware you might get confused by uh, some changes in, in symbols, uh, velocity or C uh, is used interchangeably there. So just working through the calculations here, there's a problem. The bond energy of ozone is 363 kilojoules per mole. Calculate the wavelength uh, that's, that's required to break the ozone. So we first work out the amount of energy in a single photon by dividing it by a mole. We then use the formula. Uh, energy equals frequency times Planck's constant from the data booklet. Uh, that will give us the frequency of a single photon. We can then, uh, using the velocity of a speed of light, work out the wavelength for a single photon. Now the key to remembering uh, these radical reactions is, uh, first of all, you need to create the radical. Uh, then you need the radical to continue on, uh, to destroy the ozone, and then continue on to be reformed. Uh, so first of all, that's a review of, of how the oxygen radicals created uh, and how that reacts with oxygen to create ozone. So that's your fundamental cycle, uh, natural cycle of O2 and O2 and O3 in the atmosphere. Okay, here is just uh, it here again. So the first chemical to break down the ozone that we're going to look at is uh, chlorofluorocarbons. You'll learn more about this in organic. Uh, that's going out of the page and this is coming in towards you. Uh, we actually write it like that so it gets smaller too, which is the preferred way to do it. Uh, and other free radicals, nitric oxides. Uh, so let's do nitric oxides first. Uh, the uh, primary action, which you don't need to know, uh, but they really should have in the syllabus, is in the, the high temperatures of, a, of your engine in the car actually forces those two together cr to create the nitrogen oxide radical. Uh, so what you're learning here is the secondary reactions. Uh, so this, this radical goes up into the atmosphere. So once again, get the radical, uh, destroy the ozone, uh, so that destroy it to oxygen. Uh, that creates this radical now, uh, and then get this radical back to the original one so it can do more damage again. Uh, so that can react with uh, an oxygen radical. Uh, creating oxygen and recreating this to get rid of more uh, O3. Now for the CFCs, uh, if you look at the, the strength of the C uh, chlorine bond and the C fluorine bond, uh, you'll find that this one is the weaker one. Uh, so that's how we get this reaction. Uh, the UV is most likely to knock off the chlorine uh, to make the chlorine radical. So once again, get the radical to destroy ozone to O2. Uh, and what's left over? get that back uh, to what was destroying it in the first place. So react that so we can grab our oxygen radical and that gets us back to the chlorine so we can do more damage. All right, an alternate reaction is this, uh, this radical here can react with ozone uh, to create O2 and there we get the chlorine back again as well. All right, so grab your radical, destroy ozone to O2. Uh, what's left over? 
make that into more of the radical so more of the ozone can be destroyed. So that's how you need to remember all these reactions. And don't forget the states as well.